thank you all for coming. We appreciate it. It sounds like an interesting program. Hugh came in one day and presented his book and uh, just checked to see if we owned it, which we didn't, unfortunately, So, but we do now. Good. And he's uh, offered to do this program and talk about his book and the history of Portland that probably a lot of people don't know about. So anyway, I won't take up any more time. Uh, Mr. Hugh McMahon. I thought you, the topic of today's talk is a book I wrote uh, a few years ago. And I wrote it from the fourth floor, 245 Commercial Street. You might recognize some of the establishments. It doesn't change in 200 years. We, uh, that was uh, 1892. And you re may recognize some of the f places. Dewey's is on the corner there, Union Street and uh, Commercial Street. And this was an excellent place to write this book on main history because I thought that was part of the history just being in there as I do in this facility here, which uh, predated the state of Maine, I understand. In 1820, Maine became a state. And this organization, the Maine Charitable Mechanic Association, is one of the oldest and longest, historically speaking, uh, buildings in the, and institutions in the state of Maine. And you can see from the pictures behind me what an incredibly important facility it was then. We forget about the movers and shakers we're often these folks here that were uh, the architects and designers and engineers and fabricators of equipment and buildings and really building this great city, uh, which is here today. It's just incredible. Uh, you may have found the, the stairs sort of narrow coming up and the elevator sort of narrow, but it's basically uh, kept the original facility the way it was. And I understand that upstairs is even more remarkable. Isn't that true, Pat? And that was the major hall and that kind of thing. And out front is the major, one of the major halls. I asked Pat, are there going to be enough chairs? Of course, there are probably for today. But uh, she said, it's no problem. If we, a bunch of people come in, we'll get them from neighbors and this kind of thing. It was kind of nice. She said, these people will step up and help her with that. So I just didn't worry about it anymore. Um, I thought I'd uh, introduce my wife, Barbara, who is acknowledged in the book in the beginning introduce Harry Pringle, I already have, our managing partner of our firm of Drummond Woodsum, otherwise known as Drummond Woodsum and McMahon. And I would uh, thanks also to all the members of my firm uh, who helped me with the uh, providing facilities, the capacity through uh, internet research and so forth to dig into uh, basically 200 years of Maine law, going back that far and bringing it up. I could not have done it without the firm's help. And I appreciate it, and this is why I acknowledge uh, Dick and Harry in the, uh, in the book. And it could not have been done without them. It could not have been done also without the encouragement of Frank Coffin, uh, for the late and great Frank Coffin, who was a chief judge of the First Circuit Court of Appeals for the U.S. Court of Appeals and lived in South Portland. And uh, he uh, had a great interest in this history and uh, told me that um, I had a duty, now that I've written it, he says, Hugh, you have to get it out there, and not just to lawyers. Make sure you get it out there to historians, anybody that's interested in history, because you've got 200 years of uh, social history here, told through these court decisions. No one has ever done it before, and you've brought this all to life. So this made me feel like I'd actually accomplished something as I got to the end of it, because you get a perspective. It gets kind of like you're grinding away, writing something up on the computer, and all of a sudden, this is a great judge. He's probably regarded as one of the great judges of the 20th century, and certainly in the federal judiciary, and uh, just, uh, Judge McCusick, who also signed on to the back of this. These were my great encouragers. And if you're going to write anything or do anything, I find you really need to ha have encouragers. So anybody that started out to do something, now I really encourage them, do it. Because it's not going to be all this time to do it. And you may as well just get it done. And you have to encourage them. And, and, and Dick was a great help. Dick said, You've, you better, he said, this is a, looks like a, this is going to be a classic. All I had to hear is the word classic to know that I'd done something. Thank you, Dick. <laughs> Let's hope so, <laughs> or not. Um, so thank you all. Um, as you can see, this picture hasn't changed much at all. That's not me, by the way, walking across there. That's some poor soul probably going back to his, uh, his shop to do something. And, um, but it might have been me if I was back then. Uh, I can't say enough about the firm and Judge Coffin and Judge Kuzik, um, it's just incredible what they've done. It, I was almost to the point of getting in, in shape to show it to Judge McCusick, and he showed it to, I showed it to him. He says, you should definitely do this. 
So they, what, what do you need other than that? And the point was no one had done it before. This is a first, and it's a, uh, it turned out to be a, my contribution uh, to the, the community and to the greater Portland and hopefully beyond. What have, what have I done here in this book? I started out, and as I was getting ready to retire, I was coming down to the end of, hi, getting down to the end of my uh, time with the firm, and I was going to be retiring, and I had a little extra time, and I thought I would go in back and look at the, uh, look at the, uh, the cases. Beginning with the earliest days of Maine in 1820, when Maine became a state, a separate state from Massachusetts in 1820, and uh, go back to the first cases, and I pulled the book off the shelf and it was there, it was dust covered, blew it off, and started reading from page one right on through. And I looked at the cases, and pretty soon I realized I better get some notes here. I started taking notes. I got a big folder, you know, the three ring deals that have the large clamps on them. I put the cases in there, summaries of my work. And um, pretty soon I had about 50 different categories, topics of law, from everything from the rights of women to the rights of the poor to the rights of corporations, to the rights of the railroad, and all of this in there, I had all of these topics, and I, then I slotted the, my summaries of these cases in there, and it took an awful long time. I would bring the books home, and um, two a day, and try to read them at night. I think you may remember, my wife, I'm sure, remembers this. I'd be sitting there, and what are you doing reading books again? And I would be reading these old law books. And I found these old cases, and I found these are interesting. They may be about horses, and they may be about this and that, but the same themes that we deal with today are all in those early cases, and they, we've come out a little bit different in the way we look at these things, but they were all there, and I, I got this whole body of law, and fortunately, one of my partners um, came in and said, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm, a, I'm almost up to 100 years. He says, why don't you stop there? I said, I think I will. <laughs> I was getting tired, so I stopped at 100 years, but then, of course, Law being what it is, you, ha you don't want to leave a false impression. So if any of the cases I had referred to in the book in the next hundred years had changed, been overruled, and so forth, I had updated. So, and I did that in the book. So it's really, it says a ramble through the early years of Maine law, 1820 to 1920. But in fact, it's pretty much up to date, generally speaking, in terms of coming into the uh, end of the 20th century. So that's the background on that. Some of the topics I covered in there were um, paupers. That jumped out at me immediately. The poor people, the paupers, the indigent, uh, who were treated like they were uh, uh, nobody, really. Um, they were just told to, uh, I was thinking the relevancy of that one today, when you see the people walking around in these intersections and begging for money. It's certainly ti time, uh, timely even today that people that don't have money have to find money somewhere. And uh, what the, main, the way the main court treated those folks back then is covered in here. Uh, railroad accidents, of course, railroads huge. First it was uh, animals and agriculture, and then you come into the middle of the middle of the 19th century, all of a sudden you can almost feel the trains coming. And I have several train pictures in the back of this book. Um, I brought a few extra copies if anybody wants one. Um, the train coming in was just an amazing thing, coming into a community. It'd be like having a jet aircraft uh, uh, building plant come in, or in, in like in uh, Seattle, having a Boeing plant right here in Augusta, and all of a sudden you, you see airplanes that are as high as 10 stories high coming into your community. Uh, the, these were trains coming in that were three stories high. An engineer would be up somewhere above the ceiling. These were massive engines and massive works that people had prepared to uh, really develop and industrialize the country. And they, they took over wherever they were. They were the, and still are, uh, really uh, major contributors to the economy. Um, public schools, I get into that because I spent a lot of my career uh, representing school districts and that kind of thing. And there's cases in here about corporal punishment, which used to be allowed but no longer is. And uh, interesting, I was just reading the other day a case uh, in the Supreme Court of the United States um, where some kids had, uh, in Alaska were engaged in some, uh, they had some drug paraphernalia and they were told to knock it off and the, the, uh, the, the, the case went up to the Supreme Court. The school board won the case, but the point that Clarence Thomas was making, and I think maybe another judge, was that these kids can't, we can't give these kids all this, these rights in school. You go to school, you go to school to learn, you don't go to school to tell the principal what you want to do. 
And uh, this is basically what the main part had said. And he quotes this very case that I have spent several uh, pages of my book on. He quoted the same thing from that case, that the object of the schools is to instruct the youngsters in moral conditions and treat them to, teach them to be good citizens. And of course, you can see today, if we ever get away from that, what uh, the courts may, be, uh, may have been right then. I don't think it necessarily makes sense to have the children in the school at whatever age maybe telling the teachers uh, how they're going to spend their day and what they're going to do with their free time when they're on school time and that kind of thing. So this is still up for grabs. The Supreme Court has given a lot of rights to students in terms of free speech and probably in some respects it's right. But in some respects it may not be right and the history is still playing out. All of this, we're in, we're in current history now. 100 years from now, people will be writing about these cases, and they'll be asking, how could they have been so right, or how could they have been so wrong? And that's what keeps me interested in this thing, is to really, when you see the cases in the book, it looks in some respects as if our court was really hard-headed and really tough to the point that we would think it was unfair. And you wonder how that happened, but you go back and you can understand how they felt. They were building an economy here. They were trying to build up a state. Maine was at the end of the line. We had to have corporations empowered to develop this state. The industry had to be there. And uh, yet at the same time, it was unfair in some respects, at least it seems that way today, um, but uh, to, to the employees. So I make the point in the beginning of this book that if I was back there in those days, I probably would have made the same decisions they do, but I'm operating under 2020 hindsight. But I'm operating under 2020 hindsight, but if I don't make, if I don't state my opinions in the book, I don't think I've done justice to it. I owe it to people that are my readers to uh, hear my opinion because I've researched it. If they want to reject my opinions, that's fine. I'm not trying to sell them on my opinions, but I'm trying to get them thinking. That's my only object. This, uh, this book then ended up with some 330p, 33 pages of text. 23 pages of photographs, 247 cases mentioned in there. It became quite a thing, and it became like, I gotta get, I gotta stop this thing at some point and pull it together. So that's what I finally did, um, and the firm uh, was very helpful in this, helping me pull this, uh, all of this information together and produce this book that I think uh, is of value to the, um, to the state, and uh, it's a contribution to the bookshelf it says History of Maine Law. It's the first book in there, but there it is. Um, some have written about parts of Maine Law and judges. They've written about judges. But this, this does uh, purport to be a coverage of the law per se. And uh, as Judge Coffin on the back said, he was kind enough to say it was a remarkable first. So I, he was pleased with it. And that made my, I was going to say day, it made my year, I'm sure. Um, when I did this book, I had to refer to the early Maine law. You know, if you're going to be critical of something, it's not a very diplomatic to be overtly critical. So I don't want to be critical of the current judiciary any more than I have to be, being an attorney and uh, not being my desire to offend. But it, it would not be candid if I didn't take shots, if you will, or take opinions at the early Maine court where I felt, in retrospect, with the benefit of 2020 hindsight, it's warranted so that someone could learn something about what I thought. Judge Coffin also felt strongly it was very important to get this out to the, what he called the general reader, history buff, that kind of person. I think all of those people would be interested in this book, and particularly people that are interested in their family members thinking, maybe I'll go into law, maybe I'll study history, that kind of thing. I tell people this would make the perfect Christmas present because it's the book I wanted when I started. Looking back, I wanted this book be available for me at many, many times during my practice to give me some idea of what came before I came in. It wasn't, it wasn't there. Now, not that it's complete and comprehensive and to the entire, it's selective, but it's, uh, it is a book and gives you some, some idea of the past. I should also explain at the beginning, I'm almost getting to the end, I'm just in the beginning, <laughs> yeah. What the common law is. Have anyone heard of the common law? The common law is basically judge-made law. There's the statutory law made up by the legislature, made by the legislature in Augusta, and then there's the common law, which is court decisions. They hand down court decisions. They look kind of like this. And they have words on them, and they are decided, they decide the case, here's the decision, here's the reason, and uh, that's what is that case has been decided. 
that is a precedent for future cases and is, becomes part of the body of thousands of cases of what is known as the court-made law or the common law. And that's what I'm dealing with in this book more than I am with legislation and statutes. <clears throat> How did the main court handle the whole question of slavery in the period leading up, leading up to the Civil War and during the Civil War? Okay. The, uh, the main court <coughs> dealt directly with this problem of slavery. It so happened that in 1857, uh, the Supreme Court of the United States, in what is widely regarded as a misguided opinion, uh, ruled by majority, Justice Taney, in a 77 to 2 decision, ruled that blacks, African Americans, basically slaves could not be citizens, and even if slaves were released from slavery, they could not be citizens. Basically, black immigrants from Africa, uh, even if released from slavery, could not be citizens. They were not citizens in the ID eyes of the U.S. Supreme Court. <coughs> It's considered one of the worst turns, if you will, the court ever took. But there it is, and it came directly to the state of Maine, surprisingly enough, because the Maine Constitution says if you want to vote in Maine, you have to be a U.S. citizen. And here we have the Supreme Court in Washington saying that blacks cannot be U.S. citizens. First of all, the uh, legislature in Maine uh, really got offended by that decision and said that it was uh, a terribly wrong decision. It was a uh, case, that it was a decision that denied, went against the grain of all people that believed in freedom and equality, that it was a disastrous decision and one that they didn't have to even think about obeying. But they wanted our court, our Supreme Court, to give them its opinion, an advisory opinion, as to whether in, under Maine law, the blacks in Maine, there were a number of blacks in Maine, and whether they could vote. Because here we have a Supreme Court saying blacks can't be citizens of the United States, on the one hand, and we have the Maine Constitution saying that to vote you have to be a citizen of the United States. So this went before our court. There were, I think, eight members on the court at that time, and they uh, all came down with one exception, saying that they were not going to be following that, de that decision because it didn't affect the meaning of the word citizen of the United States as that word is used in the Maine Constitution. It may have affected the meaning of the phrase citizen of the United States as used in the U.S. Constitution, but not the Maine Constitution. So it could be said they sidestepped that by just saying it really doesn't apply to us because we're dealing with the Maine Constitution. And we interpret the Maine Constitution, thank you. And there's a clear history in the Maine Constitution that when the Maine Constitution was being put together, uh, probably right down the street from where the building is, when this building was in operation, someone made a motion that they exclude blacks from voting in Maine. And the chairman of the drafting committee, Holmes, he said, uh, that's, that's not the way it is at all. God made no difference between us and the blacks and whites, and our constitution didn't either. We're not going to go there with that. And we've always been a free state. In fact, we came in as a free state. So uh, the, our court had... Uh, Nothing but bad, uh, nothing but a good decision. They had a good decision. They disagreed with the U.S. Supreme Court, but they didn't really have to take issue with them because they were saying that as far as we're concerned, under the main, under the main Constitution, they're citizens of the United States, can be, even though they may not be under the U.S. Constitution, but they didn't have to deal with the U.S. Constitution because the legislature asked them about voting in Maine. Now, two members of our court really uh, were so offended by this, and one of them was... This is my new, I got a picture of him for this event or for other events. That's the great John Appleton, probably the most famous judge in America in the middle of the uh, 20th century, right here in Maine, a Bangor boy. He was on the court for some 36 years and really a truly great judge. He's the one that spearheaded the whole motion of letting defendants in criminal cases testify. If you were charged with a crime in those days, you couldn't testify because they didn't trust you. And he, they, 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 you couldn't testify. I mean, it, it seems incredible, but Appleton went overseas, he went over here, he went around, he wrote a book on this. It's in the Maine State Library on evidence, Appleton on evidence. I found it up there, it's right on the shelf. Um, and he uh, was credited, it's in the book, uh, by the U.S. Supreme Court, Appleton of Maine, as having done this great work. 
And uh, nowadays, no one even knows about it, the sad thing. So my job is to bring this all out. He is a great judge. Uh, he sometimes got it wrong, if you will, from our 20th century perspective. But uh, what a great guy. And he said, um, it's worth noting what he said. This, is, this whole uh, research uh, transformed me, and uh, this is part of it. So uh, you, you can't read this history, and going back to uh, Jefferson, and uh, here's what Appleton said. The equality of all before the law is the elementary principle of our institutions. He had a way of stating this. The equality of all before the law is the elementary principle of our institutions. He said the Constitution of Maine recognizes as its fundamental idea the great principle upon all which all popular governments rest, the equality of all before the law. It confers citizenship and entire equality of civil and political rights upon all its native-born population. So the fact that someone may have been a slave, uh, may have been emancipated as a slave, uh, obviously, certainly if he'd been emancipated and was no longer a slave, and was able to walk around and go to the polls, he, anyone in Maine, uh, black, could vote. He said the people of this state, and he was, he was I think, enjoying getting this down, because, you know, these judges don't get a chance to write decisions whenever they want to. They have to wait, some say like an oyster, waiting at the bottom of the sea for a case to drift by and take a grab. <laughs> Otherwise, they have a pretty quiet life. Oh, I'm going to be a judge. I have these exciting cases. You may not. You may wait a long time. It just so happened that he was the chief justice and one of the great writers and judges. Where is he? Right here. Still there. Uh, distinguished looking, that's for sure. And uh, he said, the people of this state in constitution assembled formed a constitution based on principle of the purest democracy, making no distinctions and giving no preferences, but resting on the great idea of equality before the law. The fundamental idea of the, of the main constitution is equality of all before the law. And this turned out to me to be the most, and it really changed my thinking about politics and everything. You can't read these things and not be transformed. Um, and in addition to um, the great Appleton, we have Judge uh, Davis, Woodbury Davis, who also has a picture in the book. It's in with the rest of them. Uh, Woodbury Davis said, this is appalling. He was really saddened by what uh, they'd done in, in, um, in Washington with that decision, that uh, he couldn't believe what they had said. The great Davis, I don't want to refer to the book too much. I try not to. It's like being in court. The judge says, where in the record do you find that? You don't want to have to look around for it. So I just have it in my head, of course. Um, the great Davis. He said, um, and this is a lot like Lincoln-esque, because at the same time that the main court was getting back to the legislature with its opinion on these issues, it's incredibly important issues, uh, same time the main court was getting back to them, Abraham Lincoln was reading the decision. And Abraham Lincoln read the uh, Dred Scott decision, which is what they were talking about. The Supreme Court said, by majority, the blacks could not be citizens. Lincoln wrote that. He said he could not believe this. It was, it was not in his view a very persuasive precedent. He didn't want to come to the point of saying he was going to disregard it, but he certainly said the Supreme Court has reversed itself before, and we're going to see that it does again. We're not going to let this stand. And as uh, Davis was saying this, um, he says, freedom of the privileged classes and equality among themselves while trampling on the rights of others was no new thing. The world did not need to be informed of it. That's not what the Declaration of Independence was all about. It was not to do that. He says, if that was all the Declaration of Independence was doing, it wouldn't have merited the respect of mankind. It would not have justified a revolution. It would not have justified Washington. It would not have justified the Revolutionary War. And their toil, sacrifice, and blood would have been in vain. He says, Cheney is so wrong on this. He says, but it was not so. It was not that. He says the Declaration of Independence was a heroic utterance of great truths. For all men, 
meaning men and women, I think, today, so understood by the world and so intended by its authors, they freely devoted fortune, honor, and life to sustain it. And then he goes on and he says, the idea that one group of people can basically dump on another group of people and say, we're going to be citizens and you guys aren't, is so offensive to him. Uh, he says, the worst enemy of our institutions could hardly say anything better to blacken the character of our ancestors. He said, the idea that one group of people can lord it over another group of people and say, we're citizens and you are not citizens. Uh, he said, it'd be just as legitimate to inquire whether the African race intended to admit the whites to the privilege of citizenship. I mean, it, it just didn't buy the thing. They all resided together. Uh, whatever their disparity in numbers and so forth, he says, such a right to declare one of them, one group of people, non-citizens, such a right does not exist under any free government. And he was so appalled by this, he says, uh, these assertions and doctrines need only to be stated in order to be rejected. So the great Davis, and I do make a point in here, that we only have to imagine, um, to appreciate the significance of Davis and Appleton really taking on the Supreme Court on these questions. We need only imagine the gaping hole that would be left in the history of Maine law if the injustice of Taney's decision had been allowed to go unchallenged by any member of the court. I, I say this is a high point in the, in the history of our Supreme Court. I was not aware of this uh, research until I got into this project. I dare say many lawyers are not aware of it. And I dare say many people that are litigating in the courts aren't aware of it. But to me, this is the kind of thing as you read through all of this, you have a completely different view of the law, whether it's civil rights or whatever. You just see what these great people were doing um, in, in terms of charting out the rights for all of us citizens and making this hopefully the kind of community we want to be proud to be part of. Now, there was one member of the court, Judge Hathaway. He said he didn't go along with this. He's going to go along with Tawny. He said, I don't agree with that. We want to have a uniform rule of national citizenship. And... Uh, he couldn't persuade anyone to his viewpoint. And um, I've spent a little bit, bit of time before I decided how to deal with this and put in there put in this book. Hathaway found no support for his view that Tony was going to control what happened in Maine. He found no support for that view from his colleagues on the court, and with the passage of time, his opinion has fared no better. Considered from the perspective of the present day, and everything's through 2020 hindsight. And I'm doing that. I don't have the benefit. I would have made the same decision some of these other people did back then. But with the benefit of hindsight, Hathaway's willingness to disenfranchise Maine's free black residents who were descendants of slaves, which in practical effect would be to establish a race-based caste system. Like there are two categories of people whites and blacks. Blacks would be non-citizens. They could walk around, they just couldn't vote. They wouldn't be like slaves, they just, they were freed, but they wouldn't, they just, you know, in between. This is what would be the result, the race-based caste system that stands out, that stands out from the pages of Maine's legal history as a radical misjudgment that betrays the ideals of liberty and equality in a democratic society. And then I go on further. It's all the more Incredible, and all the more misguided for Hathaway to have pronounced that opinion because if truth be known, Maine was the only state in the Union, and this has been established by scholars that at that time, by uh, James Kent in his early commentaries on the law in the 19th century, Maine, and, it's, and Tony even cited this in his decision, that Maine's the only state in the Union where blacks were treated with complete equality. So why, having, even Tony having said that, Hathaway felt he had to uh, disenfranchise them. Uh, we'd have to find out. Uh, he, had, he felt so strongly in terms of uniformity and a universal rule for the country that he was unwilling to take issue with, with Tawney. But Appleton and the rest of them, and Davis and the rest of our court, said they were not going to go along with that. So that uh, the rights of blacks were secured by the main court. It's a great, it's a great high point, I think, in the history of our Supreme Court to so stand tall 
uh, for the equality of rights for all our citizens. And can it I should be known, I think. Oh, yep. When you're finished, I'm you're finished. Ask a question. You used the word that writing this book transformed you. It did, it transformed me. Could you elaborate? Right, you cannot it transform me. Um, see if I can explain that to you. I read the Declaration of Independence, Thomas Jefferson. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and endowed by the Creator with certain unalienable rights. All were created equal. Basically, the king, we don't have kings. We don't have people that are up there or down here. They aren't born into it. All are created equal. The main constitution starts off right out of, right out of the gate. Unlike our, Supreme, out of, like our federal constitution, which starts off by saying this is how we're going to govern. Executive will do this, the legislature. It's basically allocating the powers of the various three parts of the government legislative, judicial, and executive. The main constitution starts off with the Declaration of Rights. Life, it basically constitutionalizes the Declaration of Independence. And that's why I put that in the book. It's a, it's a very liberal and provides a basis for a lot of lawyers and a lot of citizenry to uh, perhaps eke out a few rights that they might not be able to find in, in the Supreme Court under the federal constitution. Main, when it came into this, uh, into this union, it became in after many years of trying to get in, it became in as a free state, as part of the Missouri, so-called Missouri Compromise. It was a very important event, and Maine was a free state. But from the get-go, from the beginning, the Maine court started talking about equality. Uh, there was one case where someone wanted to get a uh, special deal cut for them in Augusta, and the Supreme Court said, no, look, hey, uh, we we, we boast that we operate under a system of laws, but that cannot be a valid boast unless we apply the great principle. Uh, we should be mindful that we uh, have a, of the great principle of equality, of constitutional equality. Uh, in this other case, uh, the Donahoe case, uh, well, let's go to the Dred Scott and the opinion of the justices on Dred Scott, uh, which I've just discussed. Lincoln's speech on Dred Scott or he was against it, and he said that. And then we, he said that that was a uh, misguided decision, and then we have Lincoln at Gettysburg, four score. In seven years, a new nation conceived in liberty, and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Then we have the Civil War, which cut a great ripping through the 19th century of everything in this country, and thousands were killed, and massacred, and died prison camps and death and in that horrible uh, war. And um, then we have Lincoln at Gettysburg, uh, four score and seven years. So if you, you, all men are created equal, what was the court saying about women at this point? The court was not saying anything about women at this point. That's a good point, Harry. The court was uh, basically, the main court was divided on women. Oh, thanks for asking that question, because that does bring up uh, Mr. Dickerson, that, that picture there next to the Dickerson is the only one who said it's just, well, the question came up this way. The legislature asked the court, can women be judges? Can they be judge, justices of the peace? We've got, we've got to process these applications. Some women apparently want to do these things. And it went to the court. The court by five to two to one. Five said, and including Appleton, who just ruled on the blacks. Uh, he said, women, uh, it's a different case. Women were not part of this state when it was founded. They were not voting on the separation from Massachusetts. They, by, they aren't mentioned as being entitled to uh, be judges. And the, the Massachusetts court had just ruled that women could not be judges. And the main court said, no, women can't be judges by a vote of five. There were two others on there that said, wait a minute. He doesn't say they can't be. The main constitution says to say they can't be. So maybe they can be. In fact, that's the way we're going to decide. So you had five to two. And then you had uh, Dickerson, this uh, scholarly judge, Colby graduate uh, from Belfast. Um, he came in and said, uh, I got to tell you, he says, you guys are missing it. You guys are going right back to Dred Scott. 
he says there's no question the women can be, they should be, they must be on our court. And probably one of the, the great decisions was a dissenting opinion, the great dissenting opinions of all time, um, right up there with some of the great ones in the Supreme Court. That this gentleman from Maine deserves, like Appleton did in that other case, a seat in the Hall of Fame of the law because he said this is definitely something that um, should be allowed. He says women should definitely be on there, and he was about 100 years ahead of his time because we had Supreme Court judges in Washington saying women should stay home. They're supposed to be in the domestic sphere. They are not supposed to be out and just get off of this. We don't want women being judges. This is what the Supreme Court's attitude was at the time in Washington. And you have this Dickerson from Belfast there. Dickerson is saying, hold on, guys. I mean, it was really a, a uh, heroic thing he did to take issue with the Supreme Court and uh, get out there with this, this view of his. He used the same years later in the Supreme Court when there was a question about whether blacks could be separated but equal, separate but equal. And the Supreme Court said in 1890, blacks could be 1890, separate but equal, they could be separate but equal. There was a dissenting opinion by a guy named Harlan, John Harlan. And he said, uh, they, 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 this is not right. Uh, this, this, it was whether it's separate but equal. He said it's basically putting down blacks. It's, uh, we don't have a, a caste system in this country. We don't have it. We have, all people are equal. And it's, he, I think he may have taken some of the language of that particular decision, which is uh, considered a great, this is Harlan in Washington, uh, with the Supreme Court. I think he may have t taken some of the, his wording of that from the earlier opinion of Dickerson on women's rights in Maine. And I've asked the students uh, if they want to go research it. I tried to find out myself. I got lost in some state box that someone had found in some of the early writings of uh, Harlan. I'll let someone else look it up. But uh, it's an excellent question. So the Supreme Court of Maine was very solid in the protection of blacks, as we've covered. When it got to the question of whether women could be judges, they kind of like didn't stand up there for the rights of women. Well, it, not all of them, it was like five to three, and one of them was very strong for the rights of women, but they were basically doing, I think, what was standard at that time. Uh, it would have been remarkable. Uh, women didn't, a lot of the women didn't feel they were discriminated against. They were in the law, as we could see it today. But he wasn't gonna jump right out there on that one. And, yep? I think he was the father of Franny Appleton. Was Longfellow's wife? Uh, she was very learned. Mm, I don't think. I don't know if that's true or not. Mm, I know this. Uh, yeah. Apple, uh, Longfellow's wife, Fanny Appleton, died uh -huh. in that uh, tragic fire. Right. She burned in Cambridge. Uh, Longfellow has a history to it. Um, different person. Yeah. They're related, but I think that's true. Yeah. It's not. not as but uh, this, this was one of probably Maine's most famous judge. I think in the 20th century, when that's written, uh, Judge McKiosic would be right up there, um, still living down in Cape Elizabeth, and uh, he's one of the founders of at least the present version of Pierce Atwood. And was, I mentioned him previously, he's in my book because I considered him such a great help to me in this work. Yeah, what was the worst decision you encountered in the whole thing, other than the ones you've mentioned? The worst decision was, I think, uh, the case of a woman who married this guy and became pregnant and had a falling out with him and got a divorce. Now, in those days, um, she couldn't, oh, the div got an abortion. She had, first of all, she had a divorce, then she had an abortion. The abortion was done by a friend of her exes, where he actually restrained her. This is post-divorce. Held her down while her husband's, ex-husband's friend performed an abortion. Uh, they didn't call it an abortion, they called it uh, Another word. It's another word for abortion. It wasn't abortion. By miscarriage. miscarriage. 
By, by he said the court, the decision says by using instruments un unknown. I guess you know something he used, and um, it caused her great pain. It caused her great injury. She said, "These were her allegations," and she took this claim into the main court. After her divorce, she sued this guy that had done it. She couldn't sue her husband or her husband after the marriage because, according to the Supreme Court of Maine in the 19th century, a woman was not allowed, or her husband, to sue the other party during marriage. Divorce, maybe, but not a, not a lawsuit. And our court said the parties to a marriage, once it's dissolved through divorce, are forever unable to bring suits against each other. They didn't want anything to disturb the stability of a marriage. That's what they said. That's why they didn't want the parties to a marriage to start suing each other. And they thought that would be undermined if they could get out of a marriage and then start suing each other. So they said, no. They said, you have to pull the, pull the curtains on the marriage and leave things as they are. And that's the way it is. Then they even went so far, this is where I think it's the worst decision. They went so far as to say, that after the marriage, the, the ex could not sue the other, and nor could she sue the person who had asked, was asked by her ex uh, to perform this. She could not sue him. That somehow he was cloaked with the same immunity that the husband was. I mean, there's no reason for that. It's like this convoluted idea. So in order to protect them, the sanctity of marriage, here's the steps they put. You cannot sue a wife during marriage. You cannot sue I mean, husband or wife after marriage. And you cannot sue anybody that performs wrong on you at your ex-husband's urging. That means like you could, if you had a hitman, hire a hitman to, to shoot your wife. This was the old way of looking at things. I want to make clear, that's not allowed. <laughs> that would get you, don't do this. I'll give you a history here, but someone asked for the worst case, and I think I covered that case in the book. In fact, I know I did, and I said, that's, if, if anything is designed to make people not want to get married, but discourage marriage, it's that case. So think of the irony. In order to encourage marriage, they tell people, you get married, you'll be fine. You won't be able to sue each other. I'm willing to go along with that, maybe. But you've got to realize, even if you, after you get, you get divorced, uh, you cannot sue your husband. Say, oh, I'm sorry, well, I'll go along with that at the time. But they never tell you, if your husband uh, tries to cause you damage by using a third party, uh, you can't sue that person then. Um, that, I think, uh, is my, uh, it's right up there with probably some of them. That it was not my job to find cases that uh, I thought were out of line with the present day. But I come across these cases, and this ought to be in my book, because it's in the chapter on women's rights, and I cover that extensively. Uh, all of the issues involving women's rights, women as witnesses, divorce, and everything else, and the rights of women, which are um, so f different from the way they are today in this book. Um, before I wrap this up, anyone have any questions right now? Uh, one question. You go what ahead. Was the, what was the worst labor condition case that you ran into? The worst the labor condition case, I think, was uh, there were many of them. It was the woman age 59 plus who had worked in this uh, mill down in Biddeford uh, who had uh, a do it job that required her to pick bobbins up, which were used to, on the, in the making of wool products. She had to pick these bobbins up under this spinning thing, under a dowel, a metal dowel that sp spun at 280 RPMs, 280 revolutions per minute. That's pretty fast. Even in the 19th century, that was fast. And she'd been there working for years. And there was uh, screws on that, set screws, they call them, that connected this, I call it a dowel, it was, it was a rod of some kind together into the machine. And then, you know what happened, of course, as she went down, it was something that was, it was so obvious, it was dangerous. She, was, she caught her hair in it, and the, the way the court describes this, that she was scalped, it scalped her. And uh, I get a pretty good idea of what that is, I don't need to go into detail on it, but uh, she sewed the, um, sued the company. And the main court said the, the risk that that would happen was so obvious. And then the conclusion was not that, this, not that they should never have allowed her to have that job. It was so obvious that she should not have allowed that to happen to her hair. 
So she was blamed for that. Uh, that's, that was life in the mill was in those days. And I don't have all the pictures, but some of the pictures of the youngsters in Lewiston in the mills. You can see that. Uh, because juveniles were treated no better. Juveniles were treated no better. Yeah. They got them in early because you could get a family if you had eight kids. Uh, you might bring them in under 14, I think it was the day. You could bring in 10. You could bring in your kids, you had a chance of getting enough to pay for your uh, food and, if, you know, whatever. Um, basic nourishment. So these were hard times in the mills. Look at these kids, they're barefoot, running around, it's very dangerous as anything. They're probably acquiring all kinds of uh, difficulties by working in that mill. Um, and the Lewiston Library um, let me make these, and I have another one that seemed to have misplaced. Uh, those women in the mills. So this was another, another world. The other one was a, uh, yeah, question, Pat. I just wanted you to touch briefly on the case you mentioned that, that related to the ice cutting industry. Ice cutting, yes. In the ice cutting industry, <clears throat> um, well, the ice cutting industry was a risky business uh, because during the uh, time of the ice cutting, or particularly on the large rivers, ice cutting was done everywhere because there was no way of refrigerating products. So Maine made, had a huge business, a wonderful seasonal business. Once the woods were closed and people couldn't work in the woods, uh, they turned to ice and ice was harvested. And major numbers out on Sebago Lake was harvested in the Kennebec, right up through Augusta there in that region, Gardner, Bodenham and all of that was, and Maine ice was favored because it was hard, it would last longer, it was colder it would, in the spring, it would still be good, whereas the Massachusetts ice was getting softer and uh, horses were falling through the uh, river from time to time and into the water. And of course, if you lose your horse, it'd be like having your car, your truck, and your pickup, and everything else. So these ended up in litigation, and the court had to craft out this law that would govern whose rights on the uh, rivers. I think that may be what I was saying. And as uh, it's mentioned in here, it's, uh, it's mentioned, it's no longer, I think there's one or two places that still do ice cutting. Uh, small little operations, but it's not a big deal right now because it, once, once the refrigeration came online, ice cutting was no longer needed and it was not a good thing to invest in. I think people probably get out of solar stock at that point <laughs> once the refrigerator came online. Uh, but at the time, it shows how, and the cases that came up show how the court was dealing with these. I've only covered a small part that's going to be spared because I'm not going to go any longer. Uh, but um, I wanted to mention this one. And you may have heard of the Donahoe case, a 15-year-old girl who was a Catholic up in Ellsworth, wanted to read the Bible, which was required reading, it was considered a textbook in the school. And she wanted to read it in the Catholic version, the Douay version, instead of the King James version of the Bible. And the school board said, no, you've got to, you've got to read our version. Uh, she said, well, I don't have some protection here. And um, they said no. So again, Appleton, I think he got this one wrong, if you will, by our standards today. But he said, um, we can't have, this has been a textbook. It's a textbook. We can't have kids picking the textbooks. That's an argument. But it's a different kind of textbook. It happens to be the, the, the religious holy book of the Christian religion and Protestant religion, the Catholic religion. and. Uh, why couldn't they have given her an option to opt out and maybe read her version? And um, that became a cause to lever which is dealt with extensively in my book. <laughs> and it involved a huge fracas between the powers that be in the town of Ellsworth, this was a dark chapter in their history, and the, uh, the Catholic uh, minister or priest down there who wanted to read the Douay version and uh, they ultimately, uh, the town's people, a, a bunch of bullies, got together and tarred and feathered this priest, left him out on the dock somewhere, uh, and he became quite a martyr and ultimately became the first president of Boston College. I believe that. And I was, a lot of time I spent wondering how could this be, because I didn't want to put that in there. Uh, is, how could this guy have become the president of Boston College? That's the people are going to look at that. But I checked it out, you can check it out. And there's a library down there, the John Baps Library, that's John Baps School, there's places, he became quite a, a national uh, figure, and this all grew out of a very hateful time. And uh, the, the main court uh, 
yeah, by t today's standards, got that one wrong. But here's the, here's the good news. In each of these areas, race has always already covered. Main stance, Paul always has. Race, uh, religion, and uh, on women's rights, as far as women's rights, women's rights today have all c come out in favor of the development of more equality for women so that it's virtually uh, impossible to justify any discrimination against women. And uh, so blacks and women, there's a black president, it's incredible, based on what Connie was saying back there, and I'm glad our main court stood tall on that one. Blacks, women, and um, in terms of uh, religion, the Supreme Court in uh, 1983, uh, recently, you see Bridget Donahoe was this 15-year-old girl in Ellsworth. She was, 150 years ago, she was told, no, she has to read this book. And she refused to, and she had uh, thrown out of school, and uh, she lost her case. But her, the argument she was making was, like I say in this book, a smoldering ember that kept going. There was truth in what she was saying. There was power in it. And uh, that ultimately ended up prevailing in the Supreme Court. So in each of these areas, race, religion, and gender, the good news is that out of all of this, out of the Civil War, out of all these various precedents, the good news is that the power of equality, the irrepressible power of simple justice, the irrepressible power of, of not favoring one group, the, the power of equality was so strong that in each of these areas it ultimately triumphed. That's what I mean to transforming. I couldn't look around anymore without being transformed by this. And then you'd have Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King in Montgomery. He's out there preaching to his people. And he says, it will not be long. They say, how long? He says, it won't be long. We're going to get this. He says, mm -hmm. how long? He says, truth pressed to earth shall rise again. He says, they say, how long? It is a great speech. How long? It's called. Um, Truth, breast of earth, shall rise again. And uh, he also said, the, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. So that this is important to know, because it affects how you look at your surroundings, how you look at the state, how you look at your people. My only hope is that lawyers particularly, and people, historians, justice particularly, will read some of this in here and find this, because it's not anywhere else. All of it, it's not in there anywhere else. And, um, and be informed by that and be transformed. Uh, as I end the book, I gave it to Judge Coffin, my script, my pages. He said, I like this, but he says, uh, you need to have a conclusion. I said, well, I have a conclusion. No, no, no. He says, I need more of a conclusion. Just a, a coda of some kind summarizes your whole thing. And I worked on it. And I, just before I went over to see him, I added this last sentence, so I think he liked it. It says here, it, it would be unrealistic to expect courts to be the dynamo that drives change at the cutting edge of each and every new development in the ongoing evolution of society. Yet that being said, and looking back over the entire history of Maine law, some of the most inspiring judicial opinions from that era are those that invoke the irrepressible power of simple justice in the face of lingering inequalities of rights, reminding us down through the years that justice remains the goal to which all law must aspire. And once you've been in the, in the books, reading this, all these people all coming at you, these victims of this and that, these people that were doing this and that, over 200 years, you really begin to see the history. It's like a DNA in Maine's uh, historical outlook. It's driving, it's moving. The arc of justice is a line. But it, as Martin Luther King said, the moral justice may be a line, but it's uh, bending. The arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. And with that, I'd rather leave you there on Martin Luther King. I hope that answers you. That was, uh, you just can't see things the same way after you've been through 200 years of Maine law. My hope is that lawyers, particularly, and others also, uh, anyone interested in history will be, go through the same experience I had looking at some of these cases. I wrote this book so it was readable, I think, by non-lawyers. You can ignore the footnotes 
it's, uh, and you can also start in the beginning, the first introduction preface that just talks about how me and my wife got started on some of this. And uh, you can go to the final chapter and uh, you can fill in the chapters you want to read in between as you're so moved. And um, you don't have to read the whole thing. It's not that kind of history book. You have to start on the first page you read on the page of the history. It's all by tropics, so it's good to be able to 30 tropics. They only about 10 pages each at most. So there you go. So uh, thank you for the time to be down here. Thank you.